Roll it, fellas. This is Ernest. <laughs> I'm gonna die! Give me a hug. You are gonna love this! Hello and welcome to Wretched. What can the righteous do when the foundations crumble? It's a question we've been asking pretty much every generation that we've been on the planet. If you recall, in the early 20th century, People panicked over the Industrial Revolution. In the 1910s, they were worried about the shifting geopolitics of the First World War. We had the Roaring Twenties and Christians were asking themselves, what are we supposed to do with this new morality? In the 30s, we had ourselves a Great Depression and people were concerned about the foundations of economics. In the 40s, we had another world war. In the 50s, we had rock and roll. The sex revolution of the 60s certainly caused Christians to wonder what is going on on our planet. And it has not stopped every single decade. And Christians today are asking the same question. And it seems perhaps that we could just be another generation that's worried about what the kids are doing these days with their progressive values, or it could be that we are actually seeing a rather seismic shift in a post-Christian world, which is leaving a lot of Christians scared and questioning. How do we live in a world where the foundations appear to be crumbling. That is what this wretched special is all about. To help us answer that big question, please welcome Dr. Stephen J. Lawson. Dr. Lawson. Thank you, sir. Hi. Well, what a joy it is to be with you uh, for this occasion, and I'm so grateful that we can look together into the Word of God and answer that question, what are the righteous to do when the foundations are destroyed? If you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 11, Psalm 11. And I want to begin by reading this passage that we will spend our time looking at today. And I've entitled this, When the Foundations Are Destroyed. So I want to begin in verse 1. It's only seven verses. It's a Psalm of David. And David writes, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, Flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I'm going to stop my reading right there. That is the question of the hour today. When the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? When David speaks of foundations here, he's talking about the bedrock of a society. He's talking about the civility and the morality of a, of a nation and of a society. He's talking about the social order, law and order and decency. He's talking about uh, the family unit. And when those foundations are destroyed, what are we to do? When he says destroyed, he's talking about turbulent times of upheaval in which moral values are just pulled down and in which the civil order of the day is in complete dismay. This is what David was addressing so long ago, and this is what we are seeing played out before our very eyes in this very hour. And this is precisely what we see in our day. Uh, the, the virus that has struck the world has literally brought the world to a, to a standstill. Uh, business has been halted. Uh, the economy has gone into code blue. The stock market is on a roller coaster and people's retirements are just evaporating before their eyes. 3.3 million businesses have closed and 40 million people are now unemployed. 
Churches have been closed and have been prevented from even meeting and worshiping God. In fact, in some places, churches can't even meet in individual cars in the parking lot and worship God. All civility is in upheaval. Uh, the police have created unrest in killing some helpless people. Rioting and looting have followed, and cities are literally burning before our very eyes and have become war zones for thugs. Anarchy reigns in the street. Uh, the police are being told to stand down. And politicians are even wanting to defund the police. And sexuality has been pushed to the limits and, and beyond the limits. Lesbianism and homosexuality are now parading down Main Street. Transgenderism is becoming vogue. Drag queens are appearing in public schools to teach the children. Boys are being told they can become girls. Men are marrying other men and adopting children. Uh, abortion is running rampant as untold thousands daily are being killed in the mother's womb. Uh, fatherlessness is growing in every ethnicity. And agnosticism and atheism are on the rise. 26% now of the United States identify as just no religion whatsoever. And in the same time, the evangelical church is shrinking in its size and in its influence. And so we need to ask the question, when the foundations are destroyed, where there is no longer a social structure, no longer a family unit, no longer economic stability, what on earth are we to do? David, the author of this psalm, found himself in just such a similar time. We don't know the exact moment that is the background to this, but we do know it was a time of national crisis and that it threatened to overturn the very stability of the nation. And this upheaval is caused by evil men who sought to do great harm to others and to literally overthrow the whole peace of the nation. The people around David panicked. And we can understand that. They don't know which way to turn. And they urged David to, to flee to some place to hide until the dust can settle. You and I need to hear what David has to say in this psalm. And we are given an example yet again that the Bible is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper, that the Bible speaks to the issues of the day. It speaks to the issues of every day and every generation. And it speaks to us directly today. As we look at this psalm, several things that I want to set before you. And first of all, David's trust. Uh, David begins with an emphatic declaration of his trust in God in the midst of this, of this cataclysmic upheaval that is going on all around him. David is rooted and grounded in God. And he begins this psalm, in the Lord I take refuge. And the word for Lord here is Yahweh or Jehovah. And it is that name for God that stresses the fact that He is self-sufficient within Himself. That God has no needs that need to be met. That God supports everything outside of Himself. And God is in no need of anyone or anything to meet needs inside of Himself. That there are no holes in God's holiness. It's known as the doctrine of the aseity of God, that God is autonomous, that God is independent, that God is never failing and never faltering, that God is never in lack of anything within Himself, that God is immutable, 
that nothing upholds God, and yet God upholds everything. It is in this all-sufficient God that David says, I take refuge. As all of the world around him is crumbling, as all around him, society and culture is, is, is crumbling before his very eyes, David has put his trust in the unshakable foundation of God himself. As the world is falling apart all around him, and perhaps even his own life is in danger, David finds refuge in the Lord. This is to say that God is his stronghold, that God is his mighty fortress, that no assailant can, can follow in behind him when he is, has his trust in the Lord. David is not putting his trust in men. He is not trusting himself. He is, his trust is not in chariots or horses. It is not in silver or gold. It is not in allies or even his own government, but it is in God and God alone. A time of adversity like this and a time of upheaval is always a time that tests the people of God. Where their trust is, have they been leaning upon human institutions? Have they been looking to human solutions? Or are they truly anchored in God Himself? Each and every one of us needs to be able to say exactly what David writes here. In the Lord I take refuge. Men will always fail us. Governments will always fail us. We will always fail ourselves. There is only one sure anchor for the soul, only one sure cornerstone, and that is in God Himself. No matter how dismal the outlook is, the uplook is always glorious. And may we be looking to the Lord and putting our trust in Him. But this leads now second, not only David's trust, but David's temptation. Because David is surrounded by counselors who are in his ear and who are trying to influence him and urging him to escape out of the trouble and the dangers that surround him. And so in the middle of verse 1, this is what David's counselors are saying to him. And this is what others may be saying to each one of us as we turn on television, as we pick up a newspaper, as we go online, we will receive some bad counsel as well, just as was being told David. So this is what David heard. How can you say to my soul, how can you counselors around me who are in the inner circle of, of David's administration, how can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? In other words, they're saying to David, David's saying, how can you give me this advice that I just need to fly away from all this and to retreat into some escapism as if I'm going to bury my head in the sand? How can you say to me, pull out in this time of, of, of dire need and just look out for myself and leave everyone else to, to fend for themselves? They see David as a defenseless bird who is unable to protect himself from the dangers that are around him. And they are saying to him, escape all the unrest. Just escape the disorder and just get out of town and forsake where the Lord has, has placed you and, and run for your own self-preservation and leave others to fend for themselves. David continues to, to echo what he says to his counselors, for behold, 
In other words, look at this more carefully. The wicked bend the bow. Society at this time was filled with godless and ungodly people who are exasperating the situation. And one godless man encourages 10 other godless men who encourage 100 other godless men to, to rise up together. And to bend the bow is a picture of taking arms, to take up physical arms in order to inflict great violence and great havoc and great danger upon others who are defenseless in society. They, they, they threaten human life and they are desiring to create such a disruption that they will turn society upside down on its head and bring the establishment down in order that there would be just great havoc. They make ready their bow upon the string. They are armed. They are dangerous. They are on the prowl. They are on the move together against innocent, law-abiding people. And they have suddenly become drunk with, with courage as they bend the bow, as they put the arrow into the string. They are ready to attack innocent people. And then to shoot in darkness. What, what courage they draw when the sun goes down, where their identity is hidden, when they cannot be seen. And in the darkness they do their deeds of darkness. And they shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. These law breakers come against the law abiders, against those who live peaceably and who try to maintain the social order. No, these ruthless rebels are wanting to tear everything down so that they can gain the power and the control. And now the counselors say to David, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We've already talked about what these foundations are. It's a, a metaphor for social order. What upholds daily life? We could say it's a, a social framework that provides stability for a civilized people that provides uh, a sure place and a sturdy foundation upon which the family unit and public life can have a firm foundation. But when these foundations are destroyed, when turbulent evil just breaks up these foundations and the innocent are endangered, and the evil men are emboldened, and they are unrestrained. The question is raised, what can the righteous do? David and others who do not create harm to others, what are, what are they to do? Are they to flee? Are they to run? Are they to escape? Well, we have David's testimony in verses 4 through 7. And in one sense, it would take the entire Bible to answer this question, what are the righteous to do? It was J.C. Ryle who said it takes a whole Bible to create a whole Christian. And we would need the whole counsel of God really to answer this question. There's no one text that can give the comprehensive answer. But what David has to say here is very important to us. And we need to hear it and see it in its context. This is what David says. David begins by declaring that God reigns. It is not the evil that reigns. It's not the devil that reigns. It is God who is the ultimate sovereign upon his throne. So David says, beginning in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy 
temple. This holy temple speaks not of the temple in Jerusalem, which has not yet been built, but it speaks of the heavenly temple where God resides. It, it is referred to this immediate presence of God in heaven above. It is pictured as a, a temple because it is in a temple where worship takes place. And it reminds us that in the immediate presence of God, the angels are crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of His glory. This is the holy temple because God Himself is holy and everything in heaven is holy. God is perfect in all of His ways. He is faultless and flawless. He is without any moral blemish. And everything that proceeds from this holy temple, all of His verdicts and all of His decrees and the commissioning that He will send forth, it is all holy and right and perfect. And what a contrast this is between the decadence here upon the earth and the pure holiness of God in heaven. David continues, the Lord's throne is in heaven. And here in the midst of the temple, the holy temple above is a throne, which is the place of divine authority. It is the seat of sovereignty. And the throne is occupied. We know this from other places. You remember when John in Revelation chapter 4, a door is open in heaven and a voice has come up here, and John is suddenly caught up in his spirit into this holy temple. And the very first thing that David sees is, is not streets of gold or gates of pearl. It's not who's here or who's not here among loved ones. And the very first thing that David beholds is not a tree of life or a river of life. What captures and dominates David's focus is a throne standing in heaven, unmoved, unswayed, and him who sat upon it is the one controlling the entire universe. What David wants his counselors to know is what you and I need to know in this very hour, that God is in the heavens and that He has established His throne in the heavens, and His sovereignty rules over all, that God is causing all things to work together for good, that there is a master plan that God has for all of human history, in which He is weaving the threads of both good and evil together to accomplish His ultimate greater purpose, how God is setting the stage for human history and one day to bring it to its appointed end in which there will be unparalleled evil that will be here upon the earth. It all is a part of the master plan of God to bring greater glory to Himself when that door in heaven will open yet again and a great white steed will come bolting out and him who sat upon it is faithful and true. And upon his head are many diadems, unlimited sovereignty beyond which any one of us could even begin to understand. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said that the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which we lay our heads at night and receive the greatest comfort. This is what David wants his counselors to know in this hour, that in the midst of the reign of terror here upon the earth, there is a reign in glory by which God in His all-wise sovereignty is causing all things to work together for good. And what they mean for evil, God means for good. But David has more to say to his counselors, and he has more to say to you and me. Not only does God reign, 
But second, God sees. God sees it all. Nothing is hidden from His sight. We read at the end of verse 4, His eyes behold. That means God sees all. God doesn't just see into every situation and into every heart. God sees through every situation and every heart. God sees the wicked with His bow. God sees the assassin in darkness. God sees those who are seeking to overthrow the establishment of a civilization. Nothing catches God off guard. His eyes, His eyelids test the sons of men. And it's a, it's a metaphorical expression as if God is squinting to bring everything into perfect focus. And the idea is that nothing is misperceived by God. God sees every evil for what it is. God sees every, every lawless act and deed as that which is cosmic rebellion that has arisen up against Him. And not only does God see, third, God separates. And God makes a distinction and God discriminates between the good and the evil. God discriminates between that which is holy and that which is unholy. And God separates the wheat from the tares. And God separates the believer from the unbeliever. We read here, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the word test here was used of metal, precious metal that is put into a furnace. And the heat is raised so to such a high level that a separation occurs. And the false alloys come to the surface and are just skimmed off the top and removed such that all that remains is the pure, precious metal. And when this says the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, it anticipates that last day of judgment in which the heat of God's righteousness will make this separation and the evil will be removed. And what will remain will be the pure faith and the pure standing of God's people before Him. But there's more that I want you to, to see. Not only does God see and God separates, but I want you to note fourth, God hates. We see in the middle of verse 5, and the one who loves violence. That is the one in this psalm who, who bends the bow, who puts the arrow in the string. The one who comes out in darkness. The one who is seeking to bring down great harm upon those who would seek to do right and live according to, to moral law. The one who loves violence. The one who loves to destroy society. The one who loves to, to wreck civility and to destroy peace and order. This text says, the one who loves violence, the Lord hates. This is an attribute of God. Not only is there the attribute of the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God, but there is also the attribute of the hatred of God. For there could be no love if there is not hatred. Holy God in heaven hates the evil that He sees. And we're in Psalm 11. Just to turn back a page to Psalm 5, beginning in verse 4. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, no evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Those are strong words. God is not neutral toward the sinner man. 
God has demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is this doctrine of the hatred of God that makes the love and the grace of God all the more amazing. That God would show His love in giving His Son for those who have provoked His anger. In Psalm 7, in verse 11, we read something of the same. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. This is not saying that we must wait till the end of time before God unleashes His indignation. This is not saying that God only has indignation on the last day, but that God has indignation every day, every moment of every day. And as God squints His eyes, and as God sees the evildoer, it provokes within the holiness of God an anger towards that one. It says in verse 12, If a man does not repent, he, God, will sharpen his sword. He, God, has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons, and he makes his arrows fiery shafts. Those here on the earth who pick up the bow and bend it and put the arrow into the string to aim at innocent people to create harm to them, this says God in heaven also has a bow, and that God also has an arrow and that he has already bent the bow. And as Spurgeon says in Treasury of David, God never misses the target. This is the God of heaven and earth. And what David wants his counselors to know is that God is upon his throne. And God is not a mere passive spectator of the evil that is transpiring in society all around and that in God's perfect time, God will intervene and God will step in and God will take care of business. One more Psalm in Psalm 9 in verses 7 and 8, but the Lord abides forever. He has established His throne for judgment and He will judge the world in righteousness and He will execute judgment for the peoples. This is our God. This is the God who reigns and who sees and who separates and who hates. There's more to the story than smile. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That doesn't begin to tell the whole story. Next, God judges. And in verse 6, we read, upon the wicked, those who disrupt the social order. Upon the wicked, He, God, will rain snares. Snares are coals of fire that will be brought down from the throne of God above. Much like Sodom and Gomorrah was consumed with fire that came down out of heaven. And then David records fire and brimstone and burning wind. This is an overwhelming combination. Not only is there the fire of his wrath and the brimstone of his fury, but the burning wind exasperates the fire and causes the flames of his wrath and vengeance to rise even higher. And so the burning wind is causing the, the, the spread and the increase of His wrath. And this will be the portion of their cup. In other words, their inheritance, their portion will be a cup. And in this cup will be fire and brimstone. 
And God will force them to drink the fire and brimstone. It's not just that they will one day be in the lake of fire and brimstone, but that the lake of fire and brimstone will be in them. And what David is underscoring is that he does not need to seek vengeance. He does not need to retaliate in like manner because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And God will inflict the severe punishment for those who destroy that which He has created. The last thing that David brings to our attention in Psalm 11 is not only that God hates, but that God loves. And this is the other side of the coin. David follows the doctrine of divine hatred with the doctrine of divine love. And in verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. The fact that God is righteous means that God punishes evil and God rewards good. God punishes evil with retribution and He rewards good because God is perfectly righteous. There is no inequity with God. There is no injustice with God. God measures the punishment to the exact punishment to the offense, and God measures the proper exact reward to the obedience, and God being righteous, He loves righteousness. And that's what verse 7 says, For the Lord is righteous, He loves righteousness. He loves it so much that He rewards it, and He blesses it. The upright will behold His face. What an incredible ending to this psalm. As number seven, God reveals Himself. It is the upright who will behold His face. We behold His face in this lifetime as we look into pages of Scripture and we see who God is. But this looks beyond this life to the life to come in what theologians refer to as the beatific vision, which is the greatest blessing known to any man, which is to see the face of God, at the smile of His countenance, and the beauty of His holiness, upon His throne of sovereignty. It says in Revelation 22, verse 4, that we shall see His face. In ancient times, average citizens would never be allowed to see the face of their emperor or of their Caesar because, or of their king. They were not allowed to come into the palace. It is only those in the inner circle who could ever behold the face of the king. What this is saying is that those who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Messiah, the Anointed One, will be those who will behold the face of God in heaven with the smile of God upon them, while those who have arisen against God and against the good of common people will behold God in a far different way, as God will be the avenger and the inflictor of His own punishment upon souls in a real place called hell. So as I bring this to conclusion, what are the action steps for us? What is the so what? How are we to respond? And I'd lay before you three simple things. Number one, trust God's sovereignty. God is in His holy temple. God remains upon His throne. God is governing. 
And we should have great confidence in this hour as we face similar unrest and upheaval. Great confidence in the unrestricted exercise of His supreme authority that God is still causing all things to work together for good. Let us trust our God and make Him our refuge. Second, remember God's wrath. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. No one is, needs to get even with anyone else. God will settle His counts on the last day, and He will bring about perfect righteousness. We will wait for the last day for God to sort it out. And then third and finally, obey God's Word. God will reward the righteous. And we need the whole rest of the Bible to know what it is that God requires of us, how we are to live, how we are to treat our neighbor, how we are to interface with others, how we are to love our enemies, how we are to share the gospel, how we are to pray, how we are to live a godly life and stand out like stars on a dark night in this world. David's counsel to his counselors is just as relevant today in this hour as when David wrote this psalm some 3,000 years ago. Human nature has never changed over those three millennia, and the world has not changed, if anything, has become even more corrupt. Let us hear David's counsel and take refuge in the Lord. If you've never put your trust in this God, there's only one way to come to Him, and that is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You must turn to Christ and turn away from your self, selfish living and your self-righteousness and all your own attempts to run your own life. You must repent of this and turn to the Lord and confess your sin and throw yourself upon His mercy. He who is the friend of sinners, He who is the Savior of the world, who said, Him who comes unto me I will in no wise cast out. Who says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. If you've never come to Christ by faith, I would urge you to come to Him this very moment. You will find a glad reception with Him if you'll come with humility and with faith and trust your life to Him. Let me just close in a word of prayer. Father, thank You for this psalm, which is so relevant and so up-to-date for this hour. Lord, I pray that You will use it in our hearts and in our lives to bring about your desired purposes in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I have some questions for you, sir. Somebody may have heard that message, trust in the Lord, your one theme, trust in the Lord. And they maybe heard you say, that means Christians are never to perhaps vote, be involved <laughs> politically, to engage socially, was that your message? No, that was not my message. Of course, you're putting words in my mouth, sir. Yes, I am. Um, no, it, depending upon whatever is the government in which a person lives, for us in the United States, it, it's a democracy in which we are given really the privilege to vote. Uh, we should participate by voting according to our own conscience and according to the values that we see in Scripture. Um, I think it is a special calling to run for office and to be involved in the political process. And those who are called to do that uh, as Christians should step forward and serve. Um, I, would, I would love for more Christians to serve in government. We need lights in the midst of the darkness. We need salt in the midst of the decay. And um, the third thing you said was what? Never be involved, uh, perhaps, in any social activities that might bring about what people would say is human flourishing. Human flourishing. That it's good for people. We, we should fix our society 
uh, perhaps have? That's, yes, well, that's far secondary. I, I, I think the primary call for the Christian is to establish the kingdom of God here upon the earth through the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we must never give up that high ground. Uh, can we do good to others? Yes. Should we love our neighbor? Yes. Is there a contribution that we could make to society? Uh, certainly, yes. It's a doctrine of common grace that we can be purveyors and means by which common grace is spread in the world. Um, Christian doctors ought to be the best doctors they can be and help establish the best hospitals that there are to care for hurting people. I think that that is uh, a wonderful thing to do. Uh, Christian education, etc. So we are not to withdraw from the world. We are to, to, to penetrate the world and be an influence for Christ. And some of that is fleshed out in uh, where we find ourselves vocationally in, the, in society around us. I want to be salt. I want to be light where I'm at, where I'm working. But I hear voices encouraging us to do things that might bring up, that might affect uh, better laws or better thinking about moral issues so that people behave more morally. Is there anything wrong with those efforts? Um, not, in an, uh, not in and of itself. We would want the, the, the laws to be on the books in our land that protect innocent life, that punish evildoers, and, if, and provide religious freedom uh, and freedom of speech and other, uh, other areas, the right to, uh, f to self-defense uh, when harm is brought against us. And so we, we should be participants in having the best laws that reflect godly values. And so I would only applaud uh, someone wanting to be at work in the world so that the laws of jurisprudence would be what I just articulated. All right. Can I, as a Christian, he, do I have to heed every voice that calls for me to be outraged or to speak against or no. to be involved in a particular issue? No, not at all. Um, and, and there are many today who are trying to intimidate Christians uh, for their silence on certain social issues. That's an individual decision that your own conscience must, must lead you to speak out. And those who are wanting us to speak out against certain wrongs that we see usually are addressing secondary issues rather than even issues that are more important. But I think each man's conscience must lead him or her to um, speak as they would so desire, but there would be other issues that you would do not speak out on. Right now in our country, whether you call it political party against political party, atheist agnostic versus Christian, the polarity is just exceedingly intense right now. Is it sometimes wise for the Christian to not engage at all and simply hold fire until a more peaceful time? Or are we called to jump right into it and bring a particular message? I, th I think it takes great wisdom to know what to say, how to say it, when to say it. What, how, when. And there's not a one-size-fits-all answer that I can give for every issue that's out there that's escalating. It may be wisdom at times to be quiet and wait to weigh in on greater issues. Wise is the man who knows which hills to die on. And it's been said, no one wants to go hunting with someone who shoots at everything. And so we should not be having to, 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 to address every single issue unless God has given us a platform to do that. But there is wisdom in, in the timeliness with which we are spoken. So your question is, should we jump in? I, I would have to know the issue. I would have to know the time. I'd have to know the place. I would have to know what has, has led up to this. 
but before I could answer that issue. So therefore, it, this means that we have to be walking close to the Lord and, and to have a sense of knowing His leadership in, in these issues. And, and beyond that, I really can't give a one-size-fits-all answer. No, but that is the answer, that there isn't a particular rule book. It requires wisdom as you negotiate all of these different situations. Let me bring it down from social structures right down to our homes. There are people inside of the same home for Thanksgiving and Christmas that get together, and some people believe that uh, COVID was the worst threat on the planet. Other people think it's totally ludicrous. There are people who believe that racism is systemic. They believe that that is statistically unprovable. There are people who believe that gay marriage is a good thing and it is a bad thing. And now they have to get together and it is tense to say the least. <laughs> How does a Christian inside of the home with familial relationships navigate through those really intense waters? Well, I think we have different levels of relationship with different members in our family. And there are different issues that you just have laid out as far as the, uh, the virus that has, the, ch the, the Chinese virus that has brought this all to a to standstill. I don't know that any of us really actually know. So I'm not gonna go to the mat on what I don't know. Now, I will go to the mat on gay marriage. The Bible is definitely spoken on that. Um, and again, if this is within a family, there's a time and a place to say things. I mean, we are to love even our enemies, and we are to show grace uh, to those who are unbelievers. Our, salt, our speech is to be seasoned with salt. Yet there are times that you do speak out that this is wrong, and again, it requires the wisdom of Solomon. Well, but I'm, I'm getting the gist of this again, because there are some people in evangelical quarters, especially if they have a microphone or a blog, that would tell you, uh, look, just, just stay out of these things, don't cause confrontation, keep harmony. On the other hand, you get, we've just gotta, we've just gotta bring truth and tell people the way that it is and let them know that they are absolutely wrong because it's not kind to keep the truth from them. But what you're saying is, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this, yes, maybe that. Yes, exactly what I'm saying, because you may, should speak out on this issue. At other times, you may need to show patience and wait for an opportune time All right. to be able to speak. That's actually, I think, more of a clear answer than I think you're imagining right now. Okay. Because typically, it's either or. You either have to be a warrior or you have to be totally passive, and you're saying there's just a time and there's a place for each. Sure. Right. I want to talk about the person who perhaps heard your message, and you just told them based on this psalm to trust in the Lord, but the reality is they're scared. They are afraid of what is happening because this does appear in our culture right now to be more radical than Madonna in the 80s mm -hmm. or Bill Clinton in the 90s or whatever they thought was bad then. Mm -hmm. it's, it does seem that more of the foundations are crumbling mm -hmm. and they're scared. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Well, I would say, number one, you are rightly appraising the situation. I mean, this is an unprecedented time and it has gone far beyond the 60s and the 70s, which I lived through. And this is a time of un unparalleled anarchy, really, in attempts to bring down established order. Um, I would say that you need to take wise steps as you chart your course as to prepare for the future. And what that is, only God knows. But this is a time to talk to your children, to talk to your spouse, uh, this is a time to make certain economic decisions. Um, I think this is not a time to, to be foolishly spending money. Um, I think this is a time to, to man your post and be a witness for Christ. I think this is a time to stay away from certain places that might bring danger or harm to you. Um, I would say simply praying and trusting God, that in and of itself is not enough. I mean, there must be wise steps that are our responsibility to take 
at, at this time. So we live in different places and we have different threats around us. And I think we have to think strategically and wisely about how we would protect ourselves if this continues to escalate. That would only be wisdom and to protect your family. So again, that's going to be unique and different for each family and each place and each person as you show discernment um, at the issues that are surrounding you. If it gets to the point, and you don't know, I don't know, but you don't need to be a rocket surgeon to figure out things are not looking great. Rocket scientist. Whatever. <laughs> if, if it works. Heart surgeon, rocket scientist. <laughs> See, that's why you're the doctor. So if, if it work, the uh, rules change so that you cannot maintain a Christian testimony or you are forced to do things, say things, participate in things that you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. And Christians could be losing their jobs. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably right around the corner. It's not far away. Right. And do you believe families then would also be in that line of potential um, compromises or they would simply be mandated or forced to not exercise freedom of religion? Do you think that's where we're headed? Mm -hmm. I do. The church? Yeah, I think that there's going to be unprecedented persecution against the church, that we will be accused of hate speech, that we will be accused of intolerance, that we will be accused of being the exasperators of the problem. And I think that we may lose our tax exemption, which would mean lack of um, tax write-off for gifts to, to churches and to ministries, but far greater than that would then mean churches would have to pay property tax. Uh, Christian colleges, Christian universities, seminaries, large mega churches would probably not be able to withstand um, having to pay millions and millions of dollars that they are not presently paying. And it would have a dramatic effect upon the church in the United States. Um, but I think we have to have our trust in the Lord. And God may have a better strategy for how we are to educate and how we are to train and how we are to assemble. Um, so known only to God, God used the persecution in Acts 8 to drive the church out of Jerusalem to fulfill the Great Commission. So how strange are the ways of, of God? And God may bring the persecution here to purify the church. A persecuted church has always been a, a pure church and a powerful church. Um, there's no worldliness in a church when the world's beating up on you and persecuting you. It has a way of separating the wheat from the tares and leaving the true believers behind. And it would certainly have an effect on the preaching of the Word of God as well. So God in His infinite wisdom may be bringing about the greatest good by allowing the persecution to come to the church. Uh, only God knows the answer to that. And as individuals have to make decisions about at work, um, there, there are many different factors that you have to take into consideration, uh, even supporting your family, et cetera. But there does come a point, that a line in the sand that you cannot cross, that you are a, a, a man or a woman of convictions and you would rather suffer um, unjustly than to remain in a situation in which you are compromising your Christian convictions. All right, close us out with this. If it's true that a tightening of Christian freedoms in the church, in work, home, universities, is God panicking? Is what panicking? God. Oh, God Himself yes. panicking? <laughs> yes, we are. We're, 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 we're concerned about these things. Is God? No. No, there's no panic in heaven, only plans. And God carrying out His eternal purposes. So there, there is zero panic 
with God. Zero. Okay? That just does not even exist in heaven. Um, God is upon His throne, and He is carrying out His eternal decree, what He purposed from all eternity past. There is no plan B. There is no plan C. There is no alternate strategy. Uh, the, the, there is no um, backup plan. God only has plan A from before the foundation of the world, and that's what's being carried out. So until tomorrow, go serve your king. Thank you for spending time with Wretched, and thank you for your tax-deductible financial support that allows us to preach the amazing gospel. Wretched, amazing grace.